Hello, we're just on a little early. I'm gonna just wait for a second for a few more folks to get on. We're gonna start this at seven, so you've got about five minutes. Make sure you grab some tea, make sure you are all ready and nourished. And as we go, I'm just gonna put up a little slide to begin with. All right. And I will be back in two minutes. Looking forward to joining you all. No. All right. I'm just going to, I'm looking at, we got 102 participants on right now. We're waiting. The things that it had a potential of having 500 participants. So just bear with me as we get started. I wanted to see if this was the case and we're having that challenge. So just bear with me for a minute. I'm going to restart this and we'll get going in a sec.
Okay, folks, welcome. Um, we have some challenges. I've got some, I got a chat in here. I am super excited to share this webinar with you. Um, unfortunately, we only, we, we upgraded our Zoom platform to have more people available, but it's only letting us do 100 participants. So I'm about to put this live to Facebook. If you know anybody else who wants to get on and can't, um, we're gonna go live on Facebook and let people see it there. Um, so just give me one minute and we'll get going on this. And I'm really excited to share with you. Also, as we go through this, make sure you leave your comments in the chat. I will go through a bunch of comments at the end. It's unfortunate only 100 of us were able to get on here. There was well over a thousand people who wanted to sign up for this. So we'll just get going in a second as soon as I can pull it live onto Facebook and that way we can have a lot more people have access if they want. Thanks for all of your patience. All right, we are live and we're going back to the beginning. Thank you so much for joining me for this live webinar. I am excited to share with you a bit about mushrooms. As you can see, I've got a giant reishi behind me. And we're gonna talk about that one. We're gonna talk about a number of other ones that are some of our just top medicinals. And I just feel like they are the right medicine for the times right now. And so I'm excited to share this with you. I've been studying mushrooms for, well, ever since I started herbalism. And, that was back around 1998. I got into mushrooms and was right into this. Moved to the West Coast here to learn more about mushrooms and to actually start growing mushrooms and to wild forge them and make medicines. That's kind of how Harmonic Arts, our company, came to birth was through coming out here and just connecting with all of these amazing wild medicines and mushrooms being one of the top ones. So I'm gonna share with you through this a slideshow and we're gonna just start with that. If you have questions, please add them to the chat. There is a, or a good open question thing. Looks like um, we've already got one from Gregory saying, um, do you think adding mushrooms into the diet could help deepen my spiritual relationship with nature? Of course it can. One thing, I'm just gonna answer that live really quickly before we get going. Mushrooms that come from the wild and any food that comes from the wild, anything like that, has what we call fifth element in it. And it has this essence of the natural world. And so if you wanna deepen your spiritual connection, you wanna deepen your relationship with this planet, add wild into your diet, add wild into your life, forest bathe, connect with these things on that level. So please ask more questions as they come along. And I am just going to dive right into this world of mushrooms. So as we get going, here we are. Mushrooms for resiliency and immunity. Now, this is a big topic. This is a big thing right now. Obviously, immunity and resilience is huge on the planet. As many of you are probably aware, we're dealing with some pretty powerful stuff going on. And it's not just a virus. It's also a mind virus that is affecting people and kind of challenging us for what, what do we really want? What is really important? And are we really in our best vital state? Our immunity has become the number one topic of the times and resiliency in my mind is the most important thing for us to focus on now and has always been. Can we be the adaptogen that we wanna see on this planet? So that's what we're gonna talk about, working with mushrooms for building our immunity, building our resiliency, and just kind of growing from there. So we're gonna talk about the top five mushrooms throughout this webinar. These are the main ones we're gonna focus on, reishi, chaga, lion's mane, turkey tail, and cordyceps. I have visited farms where these grow. I have picked many of them in the wild. I have made extracts, tinctures, medicine, worked with them with clients, uh, you name it, and worked with them in formulas, added them in combinations. So I've spent a lot of time learning about these. We're gonna talk about them, but you know, as a mushroom enthusiast, whenever I start talking about mushrooms, most people go, oh, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about those magic mushrooms, right? So. We get, we get that coming up all the time. So anyway, actually I'm gonna go back one. Really, what are they though? What are mushrooms? They're not the actual organism. Mushrooms are the underground 
fruiting, they're the fruiting body of an underground mycelium. The mycelium is the tree. So I'm gonna start this webinar by telling you a bit about the deeper level of how mushrooms show up on this planet. And then we're gonna go into what are the main mushrooms to work with and how do we uh, work with them and extract them and what are some of the benefits of them. So one of the biggest things that came from my understanding originally is that mushrooms were actually one of, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting people messaging me saying, I can't get on the webinar. Don't worry, you'll be able to see it in the recording if you don't get the whole thing. Anyway, mushrooms share a very similar DNA to plants and animals. And this is one of the biggest things around how they work as medicine. And this is something that really I was, this was the big aha for me when I realized, okay, mushrooms are similar to us. They breathe oxygen. They eat and they need food sources like plant, like animals do. They don't produce their own energy. They break things down and utilize the nutrition like we do. They also have a mind very similar to us. The neural nets of the mycelial work like the wood wide web, so to speak. We'll talk a bit more about that. But they have such similarities in the way that they show up. I know they're very different from us, but that's one of the ways they work. Did you know that? The main active compounds in uh, many of the medicinal mushrooms, the polysaccharide, they form like a triple helix shape, very similar to our DNA, that it's a double helix. So we share similarities. And this is a big reason why I think they really help us on this planet and work with us on this planet as one of our best immunomodulators. And we're gonna go into that. But before we do, let's talk about where mushrooms are found. So where do we find these things? These things are everywhere. They're from the stratosphere all the way down to a mile below the surface. So if something catastrophic happens on this planet and we lose the topsoil and we global warming happens, whatever it is that happens, there's so many opportunities for this planet to shape, change. And we've been through ice ages. We've been through all this, these different things. Well, the mycelium are all the way up in the stratosphere in the spore form and way deep down underground. So that's a big thing about them. They show up everywhere. So if this planet goes through another apocalypse, well, the mycelium are gonna come back up and grow and build another forest planet. That's the beauty of these, this whole category of organisms. So we've seen that they make up about a quarter of the biomass of our planet. So mushrooms are actually one of the biggest organisms on this planet. The only thing that's a larger kingdom is bacteria, which make up a little more than that, about 30% of the biomass of the planet. This between the two of them is well over 50% of the biomass of planet Earth is bacterial and fungal. So this is a big thing. They act like a neural net, like a consciousness for our planet. And if we ad adopt the understanding that all life is sentient in some form, mycelial nets work like Mother Earth's kind of nervous system, immune system. So it's one of its bio remediator, bioresponders, modifiers that we see. So, all right, <clears throat> 1.3 billion. How many of them are there and where do they come from? Essentially, they've been on land since the beginning of time. This is a big thing with mushrooms. We see that plants have only been on land for about 700 million years, whereas mycelial nets have been colonizing the lava rock of this planet. And there's some belief that actually mycelial nets are the original kind of the farmers of planet Earth. And maybe they are the seeds that go through the universe and cultivate and grow planets out because many of them can survive in space. Like I said, they can survive at the stratosphere level. So there's definitely some belief that they might have been the original organisms that helped colonize our planet way, way back when. And we can see some of the petri or, or petrified giant old mushrooms that are like 30 stories tall from the prehistoric era. So there are some really old mushrooms that are out there and they've been on this planet forever. We also know that there's some of the biggest organisms on our planet. There's a honey mushroom in Oregon that is, well, it, it covers over 2000 acres and it's, we don't know how old it is, but they've tested it and, and it's not the only one. There's plenty of other ones like this that comes from one single spore. The whole thing is genetically similar and it is one organism over 2,400 years old, potentially up to 8,000 years old. So these are old, old organisms and very powerful, very potent, 
Um, yeah, they're, they're, they've been on this planet. I believe they are the guardians of our planet. And so when we look at the top mushrooms, we look at some of the ones when we see them, we realize that these are like the sentient beings, the top ennobled species of the fungal kingdom. So um, that's something that you, you, that's one of the things that I've learned that is one of the most important things. All right, is that they actually are the top, top organism of this planet. They're very intelligent. When we want to look at the basic mushroom life cycle, I'll say that mycelial sex is, is pretty kinky. It's actually um, this really interesting kind of kundalini dance that happens. It all happens in the spore pad, depending on whether there's gills or polypores have those multiple pores. Some have sponges, some have spikes. But in there is where the, the different like gram negative, gram positive um, hyphoids kind of nuclei form and they come out into spores. What's interesting is that the spores will float up into the stratosphere and when the clouds form, uh, they, they cover the water vapor in the clouds and help super cluster the water and make rain. So actually spores help increase and create rain in the, in the clouds. So this is a big piece of how they work. Uh, they then produce the rain and drop back down. When they get to the ground, mycelial nets form. They find gram positive and gram negative ones and they start to twine together. Now, they don't have a relationship so, sim so much like humans, which is uh, monogamous. They can have polygamous relationships. They can have male on male, female on female, male on female, and multiple of them joining together. But once they mate, they mate for life and they stay together for life until they produce of super clusters inside of this mycelial net. It's kind of this weave and it grows up into these egg shapes and boom, out comes this beautiful fruiting body. That's their sexual reproductive cycle is through the fruit. So what we work with as mushrooms is really just the fruit of the underground organism. Now, when people talk about mushrooms, they think about psychedelic mushrooms. First off, so many people think, oh, you're into mushrooms, eh? Yeah, I've done those. I'm a fun guy too. Well. This is what people think of. And you know, there is some evidence now, we're starting to see a lot more around microdosing and hero dosing and medicinal potential qualities of cross brain neurogenic communication. This is believed to be what happened in the story of Alice in Wonderland, that she might've eaten some mushrooms and fallen down the rabbit hole. Regardless of this, we're not here to talk about that, but it's just, it's interesting to me that mushrooms have a huge story and huge history in our planet. And this idea of this resurgence now where we see the medicinal mushrooms coming into focus, but we also see this microdosing uh, phenomenon starting to grow as an awareness point. My recommendation with any of that is uh, do your research. Uh, don't, don't go crazy with this. I've seen people though who are doing microdosing and find that when they add the reishi and the lion's mane and some of the medicinal mushrooms to that, it really enhances and grounds the body in, in a much more potent way. So our medicinal mushrooms can also be used with that. The other one that people think about when it comes to mushrooms is the Santa Claus mushroom. You know this one, the red and white folkloric uh, agaricus, or sorry, the fly agaric mushroom. This is the Mario mushroom. It's the emoji mushroom on your phone. This is the most famous mushroom in the world. And originally the flying reindeer shaman people literally were shamans who their reindeer ate these mushrooms and they'd drink the urine of the reindeer, which would post metabolize all the toxins out and it would give them that bigger altered state. So this idea of flying reindeer was really about getting high on reindeer urine. And the other piece of this story that's really interesting to me is that these mushrooms would dry upside down. The squirrels would harvest them and they'd dry them upside down in the trees. And that was the original Christmas tree. And Santa Claus was really a shaman who worshiped these mushroom gods, so to speak, because they changed the sensory gates. This is the thing about the psychedelic mushrooms and these type of mushrooms is that they actually pivot and shift the gating perception of what we see in the world. We know we don't see the whole picture. And this is one way of opening up the veils. Now, I'm not prescribing to this. I'm not suggesting it. I'm just saying that this is a big piece of how mushrooms have shown up um, as a potent piece of human consciousness. When we look all the way back down to the Mayan culture too, they had all kinds of worship around this type of thing. 
What we're seeing now though in the modern world is a lot more around working with medicinal mushrooms and some of the benefits of that. We've seen a lot of science come out of that. But something else that's becoming really clear is this idea of the wood wide web, of nature's internet. This is something that is uh, starting to grow in, its, in our awareness. And as their science starts to kind of catch up to this, we've often known when we go into the forest, we get better connection, right? You might not get Wi-Fi, but you're gonna get better connection. And this is the connection to the mycelial net underground. Well, there's been a lot of science now showing where they, they put in these little chemical markers into a, a mama tree, a big old fir tree in the forest, and UBC did a bunch of studies on this. They put the chemical markers into the big old tree and they watch where the energy goes. And the trees use the mycelial networks to send nutrition to their offspring, to all the baby trees. So actually trees in the forest, they mother and nurse their baby trees. You know how when your little tree is small, all these big trees are way above it, there's no way it can get any good light because it's down here. Well, for the first few years, up to like 20, 30 years, these trees get nursed by the big old trees of the same species. Now the fungi also use this kind of mycelial, what's called a mycorrhizal connection, which is myco mushroom rhizal root. They wrap them around the, the roots and they, they actually up channel all kinds of nutrients from rocks and from mineral deposits all over the place. So the mushrooms work like a mediator and they pull out and take out nutrition and they feed it to the trees. Many of us think of trees as getting their nutrition from their roots. This isn't actually true. Most plants get more nutrition from the fungi and bacteria that they symbiose with than they do from their actual root systems. Those roots are more like the tree brain that goes into the internet of the forest and connects in with the information it wants. Think of mycelial nets as kind of like Google in a way, like when a tree says, hmm, I need to learn about this, boom, the mycelial net helps support it. This is how they work. They also send chemical signals through this uh, in order to let the tree tell other trees, say there's a new bug, a new predator in there, the tree can send that chemical signal far through the forest to let the other trees know, okay, time to pump up your terpenes, time to get your anti-parasitic uh, chemistry on, we've got a new predator, or, oh, there's, there's a cold front coming, or whatever that is, they communicate almost like a radio uh, frequency internet. So this works like a bit of an immune system and a bit of a nervous system for the forest, which gives us another understanding of how some of these medicinal mushrooms work in our body because mushrooms or mycelial nets harmonize the natural world. They create these forests. We see that many of these mushrooms, for example, that honey mushroom that's 2,400 to 8,000 years old, it was there before any of the trees that are there now. It's far older than this. It's colonizing and growing these forests. And the mushrooms want, or at least the fungi and the, the mycelial nets, want a temperate environment. So when you go into a forest, you'll notice it's warmer when it's a cool day out, it's warmer in the forest, or it's cooler when it's a hot day out. This is their way of modulating, and they use the trees and the biomass to do this, but this creates the ideal environment for these mycelial nets. The other thing is, is they prescribe to something called coopetition. They're not really competing. This is an old human story of competition. We believe in, and unfortunately Darwin, even on his deathbed, was like, I wish I was never known for survival of the fittest because this is just not a true story. Nature doesn't work like that. It works in coopetition, in that sense of they work together to create a more complex, stable environment. And the mycelial nets are a big piece of creating that st stable, complex environment. So if there's a type of tree species in the forest that is low in nutrition, say cedar tree is dying this year, um, it's not doing very good, mycelial nets will send more energy towards it and help support it. They also work like the Swiss bank account. They are literally the big cache of carbon underground. Did you know that there's more carbon in the soil than there is above ground and most of it's stored in the mycelial net. So far more than we see in the trees. Anyway, I'm really jammed about this subject, this idea of the wood wide web and this kind of communication network that's happening underground, but we're gonna keep moving. So why we get such connection when we're in the forest is because we have this innate 
desire to connect with other species. We are not meant to be alone on this planet. Humans are not outside of the natural world. I know you know that, but it's just something that, that is a reminder to me. Whenever I go into the forest, I practice what's called Shinrin Yoku, and it's this idea of forest bathing. And I highly recommend it, especially in some of these tense times that we're in right now, where there's a lot of anxiety and tension and some what I'll call victim consciousness, where people are feeling a little helpless, unable to really do much, stuck at home, get out into the forest. If you live in a place where the forest is an hour away, well, if you've got time, go spend the day out in the forest right now. I highly recommend connecting with mycelial nets. And when you go to the forest, remember it's just because you can see the trees, those are not the main life force. Yes, there's so much there, but remember there's more carbon sequestered underground in these mycelial nets you just can't see. In that darker subsoils, we see these. And remember the mushrooms, some of them can grow up to a mile below the surface of the earth, or of the earth. so they're way deep down. And when you breathe in the air, you're breathing in thousands of spores. It's such an intelligent, uh, natural way to, to kind of pick up wisdom from the planet is to forest bathe. So anyway, I think forest time is the best kind. That's why I live on the West Coast and I, I live in a forest and I enjoy that. My recommendation, one of the best health practices we can do is that. I think first and foremost, it's the, the favorite thing for me. But we're here to talk about mushrooms and how they work for our resilience. This is just one way they build our immunity is in forest bathing. I feel really guilty for all of the people who want to join this webinar right now. If you're watching this in the replay and you weren't able to get in, I'm really sorry. We set this up for 500 users and Zoom is just overloaded. And so it's stuck on the 100 users. We'll have this fixed for the next webinar. And we definitely have a replay for, for all of you. And it's live on Facebook if you want to check it out there. Okay, so one of the things that we can use for mushrooms as resilience and to support our immune system is we can grow them ourselves. This is really simple. Uh, there's plenty of websites all through the States and some on in Canada where you can buy what are called these little, um, these little um, dowels. We can buy these and they're full of mycelium. We can drill holes into fresh alder woods and grow out shiitakes or oyster mushrooms. Or we can use harder woods like cherry or oak or maple and grow out reishi mushrooms. This is one of my friends uh, with his fruit. This is us. We do this free the log inoculation, free the mushrooms log inoculation class, where we simply get together. And I know when you're social isolating, you can't really do that, but you can do it on your own. You can right now, if, if you have access to it, get 40 40 uh, alder logs and buy a thousand plugs and plug them all up. This is simple. There's easy methods of doing this online. You can easily Google, Google research this. I found, I've got hundred, hundreds of these logs and I found that this is a huge abundant food source for us in the spring and the fall. So right now we got shiitakes going off. Oysters are about to pop. I can tell the logs are getting ready for them. Uh, and it's just a great way to connect with mushrooms. If you grow, if you live in a semi-temperate climate, if you live in a really dry climate, then you can grow these either in your garage or you can grow them in your bathroom. I've seen plenty of people with like six or seven logs in a more humid environment in their house. And or you can buy these nice bags that are fully inoculated grain spawn in a kind of straw mulch and you can just stick them on top of your fridge and grow those out. For like 20, 30 bucks, you can get a couple of good bags. Highly recommend you grow your own mushrooms because it's not that hard. There's lots of resources online to find out about this and it's one of the best food sovereignties that we have. So check that out if that interests you. Plenty of blogs, plenty of people who are fanatic and can teach you more about this. But you can also get access to all the spawn all of the bags, all of the materials needed to grow this just through the online community. Okay, so another way we, what we're gonna really talk about tonight and what I actually wanna focus on is our tree loving polypores. So those are the best mushrooms. Those are the ennobled species as I call them, the levity eaters. And I just, I wanted to share about that because that is something that I, I find to be Probably the, the, the number one piece of these mushrooms is these ones that grow on the trees. And why I call them the ennobled species is because they're kind of top of the food chain in the world of mushrooms. Many of these have antifungal properties, which means they kill other 
competitor mushrooms. They have antibacterial, antiviral properties. They're immunomodulating. These are the top mushrooms. And why do we call them levity eaters or something I'm liking? I like this term levity eater. And I just, it's, it gave me a real brain hook on how to connect with mushrooms and why they're so potent is because all life needs this fifth element. It needs this kind of energy force of spirit, of chi, of piranha, of vitality, as we say, as we speak. And vitality is often is the opposite of gravity. It's levity. So any species that is walking around or any tree that is growing up is defying gravity. We like to, I like to look at the world as, as we live in this kind of bipolar world of yin and yang and night and day. By the way, it is a super moon tonight. So if you're out there, howl at the moon. But, but we live in this world of male, female, right, left. What's the opposite of gravity? It's levity. And these mushrooms eat the trees which produce the most levity of anything in the natural world. They defy gravity more than anything. So what's sequestered in their carbon is this kind of levity in essence. So these tree eating mushrooms are basically harvesting the best form of levity on the planet. So I call them levity eaters. I think you're a levity eater. I think I'm a levity eater. And my recommendation as far as diet for resiliency and immunity is remember to look for foods that have levity in them. Don't worry about the carbon or, or don't worry about the protein and fats and carbohydrates and vitamins and minerals. Yeah, that's all important. But like, what is, does it have fifth? Does it still have essence, life essence to it? This is why fresh food is so good compared to canned and frozen food. It's lost some of its levity. In, that's what, how I shop. I look for local, I look for close, I look for foods that are vibrating still. And that's my recommendation as far as diet, is to look to levity, look to finding the fifth element in your food. Um, and sometimes we can preserve this, right? We can preserve this and mushrooms do a great job of preserving this. And that's one of their aspects. Now, I know that's not very scientifically correct and you might wanna follow your paleolithic diet or your um, ketogenic diet or your whatever diet you choose, my diet, is the levity diet. Follow the, follow the energy. Look to the good energy. All right, it's another piece of resiliency in my mind. So we're gonna talk about mushrooms. These mushrooms have very basic kind of two types of chemistry in most of these medicinal mushrooms. And that's kind of where I wanna spend some of our time tonight is looking at the active compounds in the mushrooms. Those are our polysaccharides and our triterpenes. Now there are plenty of other compounds in these mushrooms. Uh, many of them have polyphenol groups in them. Some of them have diterpenes. Some of them have various flavonoid groups and antioxidant groups. There's lots of different chemistry, but the two main ones that we've studied and really heavily focused on in the world of medicinal mushrooms is our polysaccharides and our triterpenes. And I'm gonna talk about both of these kind of bits of chemistry a little bit in depth so we can understand why mushrooms work so potently and what is the kind of, not the science behind it, but what's the back base behind it. So first off, what's a polysaccharide? If you break the word down, poly is multiple, saccharide is this kind of sugar, right? These, these sugar, so it's a multi-carbon chain chemical. It's not like sugar, like a disaccharide or a sucrose or fructose or glucose, which are very simple, small sugars. These polysaccharides are kind of like, if you can imagine, I'm sitting in a chair right now, and that's one carbon chain. My chair is one carbon chain. If I look at a polysaccharide, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of chairs. We're talking about a whole Colosseum. It's like BC Place or the Saddle Dome or some kind of large Colosseum of chairs. It's thousands of these. And it's, it seems really simple, this chemistry, because essentially it's just carbon and hydrogen times thousands and thousands of them. But it's not about the carbon and the hydrogen. Yeah, there might be some other chemistry in there. The beta-glucans have a protonous kind of nucleus core to them that kind of holds it all together and binds it. And that's one of its brilliance in that sense. But all of these large carbon chains, it's actually about the shape of them. They work like an Aztec glyph kind of janitor's key to unlock our immune system and to help support it and give it nutrition and food and 
weaponry, if that's what it needs, to protect it from pathogens. This is a big piece of the polysaccharide. Another way to look at it, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, is that the polysaccharide is shaped like a triple helix DNA, very similar to our DNA. And this spiral shape, this kind of Fibonaccian uh, golden mean sort of spiral genetic shape is part of how it imparts wisdom onto the body. These act as what we call biological response modifiers. They modulate and they are the number one piece of defensive immune response that the mushroom has to protect itself. Remember these mushrooms don't produce medicine for us. They produce this chemistry in order to protect themselves from some of the most potent pathogens on the planet. They live in rot. They live in an area where there's lots of food source and all kinds of opportunivores that are different pathogens that want to take advantage of that. So that's how they work. That's what they, they live in. And so this is their immunomodulatory function. And the beauty of these giant shapes is that they can take pieces off and shift them and tweak them and make them work in different ways. Mushrooms like reishi, like this big reishi here, and I know that's a crazy huge mushroom. Um, it's one of the biggest ones I've ever seen in my life. Um, they have over 400 different polysaccharide groups. So a wide variety of these. The beta-glucan is that one with a little more proteinous core that kind of helps really be the, the top biological response modifier. So we'll see in many of our medicinal mushroom products that they're measuring it to the beta-glucan content, to the polysaccharide content, in order to um, understand what kind of potency it has. We find these in every single one of these tree conks. Every one of these mushrooms that is wood-like and has multiple pores and grows on a tree has beta-glucans and polysaccharides in them. They work in some of the ways of turning on the immune system. And this idea of the immunomodulator is that if we're too high of a level, say we're way up here in autoimmune state, we've got rheumatoid arthritis or seasonal allergies or Crohn's disease or fibromyalgia, one of these systems, one of these imbalances where our body is attacking itself, uh, this comes in and modifies it and modulates it and calms down that over heightened immune system. If we have immunosuppression, say we've got a cold or flu or virus, this helps bring it back up. Now, one of the things, one of the comments that some people are really concerned about with COVID-19, for example, is around the cytokine storm phenomenon. And do any of these polysaccharides affect the cytokine storm? And there's been a couple of research papers put out that are concerned about that. I will say that any of these whole mushroom complex that have a wide variety of these, not just single extracted single bits of chemistry, have a profoundly beneficial effect on modulating the immune system. And they are some of the best things that we can use when it comes to working with viruses. So they're actually one of our top defenses. And there's a couple in particular that work really good with working with flus and colds and viruses of this part of the body. And those are ones like cordyceps and reishi chaga and turkey tail are top mushrooms and i'll get into each one of those as we go along but we also see that these mushrooms because they were they the polysaccharides help support the immune system it helps regulate the immune system to see tumor systems and so there's a lot of research now on mushrooms working with cancer because these polysaccharides help regulate the immune system so it can see and enhance that and work with understanding tumor systems so the body can recognize them even because sometimes it doesn't even recognize them. They're also very anti-pathogenic, which means many of them are antiviral, antibacterial, anti-parasitic, anti-protozoic, anti-fungal even. Uh, and this idea of a um, fungus that's anti-fungal is sort of like the cat and the mouse question. It's like, well, both of them are mammals. One's an um, anti-mammal mammal, if you get my drift. This is anti-fungal to the lower level funguses like candida. This is a big one that people ask often about mushrooms. Can they help with candida? Well, some of these medicinal mushrooms, yes, they work profoundly in helping support people who have candida um, to help bring those levels down. Whereas mushrooms like your button mushrooms and your oyster mushrooms and your portobello mushrooms, they don't help at all. They actually increase the candida. So it's something to just to look at and to be aware of. <clears throat> anyway, okay, so, Next is we look at, oh, looking at the triterpene content. Triterpenes are very different from these. They're very small bits of chemistry. They're like little steroidal compounds, very tiny. 
and we mostly find those in the surface of the mushrooms and in the spore pads of the mushrooms. This is where we find most of those triterpenes. So they're in the fruiting bodies, they're not in the mycelium underground, whereas we see the polysaccharides in some of the mycelium underground, but the triterpenes we only really find in the fruiting bodies. And same with a lot of the diterpenes, and a lot of the polyphenols, and a lot of the other unique bits of chemistry. We don't see those in the underground mycelium. We see them much more, these antioxidant compounds, in these fruiting bodies. And those work <clears throat> much more as antioxidants, some of them. They also work anti-inflammatory, protecting the liver is a big piece of that. Some of them are very antiviral. This is, these terpene groups are much more single directional versus these um, polysaccharides are dual directional. They're more modulators. These terpene groups are going to act in more specific ways with more potent chemistry. So we see that in reishi, in the bitter flavor we get from the reishi mushroom. It's all the terpene groups that are <clears throat> highly potent and are going to affect um, that antiviral kind of effect they have. <clears throat> I'm just going to get some tea. <clears throat> I've got a cup of chaga tea right here. So anyway, these are some of the main active compounds. Terpene groups can only be extracted in alcohol. Uh, you can use some like glycerin and vinegars, but not, they don't work very good. Alcohol is one of the best ways to extract terpenes. Some of those terpene groups though can be extracted in oil um, if you find it that way. Or CO2 critical extraction can also extract them. We'll talk a bit about extraction methods. Polysaccharides though are much more water soluble and that's what we're going to go to next is the extraction methods. But just because I know the questions are building up, I'm going to take one quick break here, stop my slide, my slideshow and oh, answer some questions. Just take a, take a quick second. All right. Um, <clears throat> okay. So um, Dipti is asking, so if you have questions, ask right now. Um, Asking about, really, can reishi mushrooms decoction be made from dried reishi slices be given to your youngsters less than five years old? Yes, we're going to talk about that a bit more. And yes, those can be used for young people. I'd say nobody under two, I wouldn't really give reishi to. I don't really give a lot of um, medicines to children under two. Maybe like elderberry syrup or something really gentle like that but I wouldn't give them to young people under that. But yes, you can totally make some of these into, um, into that. And we've got another question on recommending mushrooms for recommending boosting your immunity uh, and immune system during and after chemo. Nikki, I'm gonna get to that. Um, I guess I can answer it now. I'm about to get into and dive into each individual mushroom in this next section of the webinar. But really, I would say that, yeah, when it comes to working with them in and after chemo, look to countries like Japan who have studied this especially with turkey tail, this mushroom right here, this one that grows on the trees, turkey tail, has been used in and out of chemotherapy. It's an anti-radiation mushroom and it really helps as an immunomodulator. So they're used that way. Plenty of people are using that way. In our Western world, we're not really allowed to say, oh yeah, that's perfect for that because people have challenges with that. And the liability and the legality issues around herbalists and, um, saying, use this even though there's so much science behind it. For example, in Japan, a PSK, a derivative of turkey tail, is used for chemotherapy and for radiation therapy, and it's prescribed and actually covered by the government and has been since the 80s. They have seen profound effects. We've seen that with radiation from like reishi mushroom as well. After Fukushima, people using um, <clears throat> reishi mushroom had a much better response to being able to heal some of the radioactive isotopes in their environment. Same with turkey tail and chemotherapy. So those are a couple of those. Um, there you go. <clears throat> We're just going to answer a couple more questions. All right. Hey, Lara from South Surrey is asking, could you please post a link to the plugs? Yes. At the very, <clears throat> let me see how I can post that. I'm going to say fungi.com is where you can, that's a I'm just gonna answer that. Um, fungi.com is a place where you can get those. Uh, yeah. All right, and we got tons of people chatting in the chat. So I just, that's a good, good source, but there's plenty of other ones too. All right, um, so for the plugs, we can find those online. I would just Google it, I would find that. Let's see, we're gonna, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, um, Haley's asking about medicinal mushrooms to be utilized during pregnancy. I would say, 
heck yeah for um, Reishi and, and Chaga and Turkey Tail and Lion's Mane. One that you maybe don't need is Cordyceps. Although if you take a five mushroom blend or something like that, that'll be fine. These are one of the best things to use during pregnancy because they're quite safe. They're like food. This branch polysaccharide is giant carbon chains. They're like food. So they're one of the best ways. I've seen a number of pregnant women drink chaga tea like I'm drinking right now throughout their pregnancy. And that's like probably one of the best immune supports they can do because there's plenty of immunostimulants that we can't do like golden seal and oil of oregano. Those are not ideal during pregnancy, but mushrooms are one of the best ways to keep our immune response up. All right. Okay. So Kaylee is asking, or, or sorry, um, Kayla is asking, let's see, um, when we lose life force energy in mushrooms, um, do we work? Um, okay. So when we dry them, are we losing life force energy? In a way, what we're doing is we're, we're, because they've got it locked into this chitinous layer and these lignans, there's a lot of life force energy in these dried ones. So we're actually getting a lot of good energy out of those. I believe that mushrooms are kind of like a time capsule for storing that good energy. All right. Okay, and Dipti is asking about where I can find high quality reishi. Harmonicards.ca. Um, we've got some of the best reishi. I'm gonna talk about that. Um, why you want to work with a log grown reishi, why it's ideal to kind of get some of these types of sources. And so we'll go into there and I'll talk a bit more about that as we go. And do I, har do I hold workshops on harvesting mushrooms? This is from Rue. I do actually a workshop that is um, pretty potent on working with mushrooms that way online through wildrosecollege.com. We offer it every October and it's a full workshop. I also go around and teach a lot more on that in live courses when I can. Okay, I'm going to stop with the questions and we're going to go back to our slides um, and just kind of keep going from there. <clears throat> All right, so here we go. Um, All right, so we're, we're on to the methods of extraction and I just want to talk about you can make mushroom medicine at home really, really easily. This is something you can do at home, no problem. When you harvest a wild mushroom like a turkey tail like this, you can break it into small pieces and you can make it into a tea. You, what you wanna do for this is you lightly simmer it. We call it a decoction. And that's simmering it for 10 minutes at the minimum, but typically 20 minutes to an hour to an hour and a half. I see some people though that decoct it down for five hours before they drink their tea. Most of these mushrooms, these hard woody mushrooms, if you harvest them from the forest, um, or if you get these, these reishi mushrooms, or some of these like, here's a reishi mushroom, a black one we wanna do, or a chaga mushroom like this. I'm gonna break it up into small pieces with a hammer or chisel or whatever it is. Break them into small pieces. You can see from my picture here, uh, we've, I've got all of these, these kind of small pieces. Um, that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to break them up into small pieces and then I'm going to extract them. So that's what I've got as a uh, pictures here is there's an, a reishi tincture. What we'll do is we'll take them into small pieces, slice them into small pieces, make an alcohol extraction, and then we'll make a water extraction like this decoction and we'll put the two together. That's how we make all of our mushroom extracts at Harmonic Arts. We do them in that method. We make this kind of water extraction and we make an alcohol extraction. We put the two together. This is the most potent form called a dual extracted tincture that I know of to work with mushrooms. You can easily do this at home with your red belted polypores, with your artist conks, with your turkey tail, with your west coast reishi or whatever polypores you have. If you've got tinder hoof mushroom, all of them, remember, have these branch polysaccharides. So they're all containing that high potent chemistry. So that's one way we can extract them. Another way that we work with at Harmonic Arts is we make <clears throat> these dual extracted powders. Now I know you can't see this, this is just a jar, but there's powder in here. And this is essentially that same thing. Think of it as a juice powder of a dual extracted tincture. So it's been extracted in hot water, some of them have been extracted in alcohol if they have those alcohol soluble compounds. Some of the ones like lion's mane doesn't have alcohol soluble compounds. So we don't extract it that way, but the reishi and chaga for sure do. So they extract it in two ways and then made into a powder that's instantly absorbable in hot water. 
This is my favorite method because it's really simple. It's easy to add into your smoothies, soups, teas, you name it. It's something we can't do at home though. We can make a dual extractive tincture at home. We can also make what's called a decoction syrup. And that is a really simple method of making a decoction, a super strong tea, and adding honey and a little alcohol to it to preserve it. This is how we might make an elderberry syrup. So follow any elderberry syrup recipe or lung and cough syrup recipe and make a mushroom syrup. This is another great way. I love making chaga syrup and I'll often add a little bit of vanilla to it. And it's just this really nice one. We can take those syrups and we make a number of those at Harmonic Arts as well. We make syrups um, that have like a chaga vanilla syrup uh, and we make a chaga cola syrup. Anyway, those syrups can be added to bubbly water and we can make a really fun effervescent sort of soda pop revolution drink, or we can give them to our kids. I find kids do really well with decoction syrups because the compliance is super high. The other thing about these powders though, that's really awesome is you can stick them into oatmeal. You can put them into sauces. You can put them into so many things and hide them. I've, I've honestly, I don't drink a lot of coffee, but when I do, I always add mushrooms in because it's a great carrier to pull it in. All right, so other ways that people make mushroom extracts is they do heat treated powders because we need to heat the mushrooms up in order to break down what's called the chitin and lignin layer. <clears throat> chitin is like the exoskeletons in insects or like your nail beds and your hair. Um, lignins are the plant fibers. So that's where we see a lot of the challenge with mushrooms is really getting all those fibers out and um, breaking it down so the polysaccharides are bioavailable. So people heat treat their powders. Many of the mycelinated um, capsulated powders you see on the market are heat treated mycelium or uh, mycelium with primordia in it, which is just the early stages of the fruiting body. This isn't my favorite form because you're not getting as much of these super potent chemical compounds like the phenol groups and the terpene groups and it's not quite as concentrated, but it's a great way to break open the cell walls and get some of that, those compounds. You can obviously make these into powdered capsules or one other method that's kind of cool, that's kind of emerging right now is mushroom essences, similar to flower essences, but they're done under a full moon like it is tonight. And you'll take the mushrooms and put them and do a mushroom essence under a full moon. There's a great herbalist, Robert Rogers. He writes a book called Fungal Pharmacy. And he also does a, another one on mushroom essences. And he's really kind of being a leader in looking at this. That's a good book I recommend if you want to learn more about mushrooms and their benefits. Fungal Pharmacy by Robert Rogers. Awesome book. Um, <clears throat> all right. I had a little video I wanted to show about our extraction method. So this is the method we make mushrooms at Harmonic Arts. We essentially do them in this method, starting with the raw material. This is at the facility that I toured um, last year to kind of see. So they start by putting them into the, like ground mushrooms go into the decoction chamber and they decoct them to pull out that polysaccharide extraction. That's kind of the easy method of doing that. And then make an alcohol extraction in other um, chambers, you kind of pull that out. Then it's vacuum dehydrated, which basically pulls the water out at room temperature. This is then spray dried into a water soluble powder. So it's really easy to be instantly absorbed into your um, body. So really simple, that's how they're done. Of course, they're all lab tested for quality assurance, uh, making sure that we've got no other things. <clears throat> all right, there's me, I'm gonna pass that one. We're gonna move on and talk about the top five mushrooms. But essentially that's how we make these dual extracted powders. Really simply to go through this process. That's not something I can do at home, but it's something that can be done in a, a pretty potent um, way and is the best extraction that I know of. All right, and I'll talk about more of that with questions when they come up. We're gonna talk about reishi, chaga, lion's mane, turkey tail, and cordyceps. Those are the top five mushrooms that have been studied on this planet for working with the immune system. Um, so first off, <clears throat> reishi. This is my favorite mushroom, by the way. <clears throat> you don't know this, but you do now, as soon as I tell you. But 19 years ago, <clears throat> I had a daughter and we named her reishi. Uh, this was a mushroom that we were really into at this time. And my partner had a dream of this old woman named reishi that came and said, <clears throat> said I'm here to help you. <clears throat> Sorry. Anyway, reishi is one of the most potent mushrooms for working with grounding the body. 
This has been the mushroom of immortality. This is the most famous mushroom on the planet when it comes to medicinal mushrooms. In China, they have all kinds of bylines for it. There's been books written on it. It's been used for at least two to 4,000 years. This mushroom is the supreme immune modulator, but why it's so useful is that it doesn't just work in the body. It works in grounding the body down. It works in bringing us out of our head and into our heart. It's calming, it focuses us, and it does something that we really need right now, which is getting out of our head trip and bringing us back into our body, back into the present moment. So this is used by monks. Uh, the Buddhist monasteries studied this. The aristocracy in, uh, the, in China all used this mushroom. This was the most potent, as I said, mushroom of spiritual potency. This was also known as the mushroom of immortality. It has all kinds of bylines. Like one of the lines is to protect the academic from their own brain. Yeah, to protect us from circular thinking. So we see this really useful for things like ADD, for people who have anxiety, for calming down tension in the body. All things like allergies, calming down the lungs, heart arrhythmia and palpitations, calming down the heart, uh, circular thinking, insomnia, calming down the mind. This is what makes reishi so potent. This is its big jam is how it works. It also works in basically working with supporting homeostasis and lowering cholesterol, having antioxidant properties. It has tons and tons of polyphenol groups in these fruiting bodies in the spore pad of the reishi mushroom. It grows up like this out of a log. Traditionally, it's a donwood or basswood log that this grows out of, and we see that it's been harvested. We have different species of this, though, all over the world. What's interesting about the Ganoderma family, which is that Gano means uh, shiny and Derma means skin, it's these shiny skinned mushrooms, is that they grow everywhere on this planet. There's a mushroom like this in almost every forest, in many of the, the at least of the, the bigger kind of older forests. And what I believe is they're one of the supreme masters of the forest. They actually are wisdom teachers. I, I personally believe that all of these herbs and mushrooms and all of these, they are not the medicine. They are the teacher of how to show up and you are the medicine. So they help support the body in finding its own regulation and finding its own harmony. Sometimes they might have certain chemistry that's gonna have a profound effect on the body, but I believe that Reishi is the supreme teacher and that's how it works really in the body is teaching the body how to show up in a more potent way. So that's my, my belief and that's how I, I see that it works. But we've also seen that it's very protective for all kinds of things like radiation or like any kind of liver toxin. Reishi helps protect the body. It's antifungal, works with candida. It works with the chemotherapy, like I was mentioning with the turkey tail as well before. It's supportive for people going through tumor system overload, very good for viral overload, very good for bacterial overload. It helps basically teach the body how to grow healthy cells, how to support the immune system and ground down into the present moment. I think of it as meditation in a bottle. That's why I take Reishi pretty much every single day because I am one of these wiry, windy type people. I have definitely got ADD type tendencies. Reishi brings me down. Forest bathing and connecting with my environment that has Reishi growing in it calms me down and brings me back into my heart, gets me out of my head. I think this is a supreme tonic for so many people of the modern age and it's just one that I would invite people to start to work with. Okay, so here's growing reishi. This is the farm that we work with at Harmonic Arts for our reishi. This is, by the way, up in the Nine Dragon Mountains, way up in the top of China. You can grow this in Canada, but there's nobody commercially growing fruiting bodies off of traditional wood in the proper method. So when I went to visit this farm, I was like a kid in a candy store. It was way, way up into the, into the hills, and I just was totally blown away by how amazing this place was and how pristine this environment was. So that's where we get our reishi. There is so many different growing methods of reishi. One of the reasons why Harmonic Arts is a kind of a leader in this is because we believe in the highest quality 
mushrooms and the highest quality extracts. So we visited our farms and actually seen where these grow. And I got to tell you, this is, I was so excited to see how they were growing this in this place. I got to meet Mr. Lee, this uh, mushroom grower and hang out with him. And he let me pick a couple of mushrooms and play with them and make a video. If you want to check that out, it's on YouTube, visiting the Nine Dragon Mountains under the Herbal Jedi YouTube channel. Um, and just really cool experience for me that way. But reishi is definitely my favorite mushroom. I go and pick it here on the West Coast. It grows and it, it comes out in August, September. We can find it on the hemlock trees. It's a great mushroom to work with. Um, one of my favorites, uh, often a little higher elevation, but I've seen it down all the way at ocean level too. Good mushroom to, to connect with. And also there's Ganoderma aplanatum, which is the, the more common one. It's called artist conch. It has very similar effects. Okay, <clears throat> next mushroom I want to talk about is the one I can't remember what it's good for. Just kidding. That's lion's mane. Lion's mane is our top mushroom for memory and nerve growth. I got to say, this mushroom, I think I got one right here. Here's a nice dried lion's mane. This mushroom is taking the world by storm. It's also known as monkey head mushroom, and it's like a little brain. But what's so cool about lion's mane is that it's, it's, actually been shown to stimulate new nerve growth factors. There are not very many things on this planet that do that. And lion's mane is one of the ones that does that. In, in China, they traditionally use it for uh, calming down digestive sy system to ground that down and work with the nervous factor there. But we've seen that it's really useful for working with the brain, for cognitive function, for memory, for dementia, for Alzheimer's. It's being studied heavily for Parkinson's and and multiple sclerosis for all these kinds of things. My favorite thing about it though, is that it makes me feel happy when I take it. I love it for winter blues, for anxiety. So lion's mane is another one I would take to calm down anxiety and to move out of a funk, to help work with cross brain communication. If I were one to look at microdosing, I would definitely add lion's mane into that if I'm working with neurogenic uh, recirculation, but really, I think it's far more potent than many of the psychedelic mushrooms in its effect to stimulate new nerve growth factors and to actually get the brain functioning at an optimal level. So we're seeing this used by many of these high level executives now who wanna have an edge on the millennials because the millennials are so much sharper than they are. They're taking lion's mane so they can remember their PowerPoint presentation. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> but, but essentially it is one of those ones that's gonna give you a bit more of an edge. Um, support neurogenesis, but I've also seen it work with people who have muscle memory loss and nervous system loss that way. Did you know that in Japan, uh, many of the ninja used lion's mane as one of their foods for helping their muscle memory, training their nervous system to, to program in these moves. Lion's mane was one of the secret weapons for that. We've also seen lion's mane used specifically in, in uh, many, many people who are trying to remember like brain gym stuff, who are trying to do all this cognitive memory work, consuming lion's mane can be one of those supportive mushrooms for that. So the big thing is stimulating new nerve growth factors, helping with the myelination of the sheath of the nervous system and really supporting it that way. But again, my favorite thing around this is it's a happy mushroom. It makes me feel good when I take lion's mane. I once, ate almost a whole jar with a friend of mine and we had the most amazing time and we didn't get high, but we had a really amazing time just, just feeling good and laughing and just having a great time uh, connecting with lion's mane. So I'm not recommending you eat a whole jar, but it is very safe and it's something you can do in pretty good levels. I've also seen people who've had major nerve damage come back after eating tablespoons of it, like eating pretty good doses, like two tablespoons a day and really see significant regeneration of nerve damage when they were told they would not uh, be walking again or talking properly again. So it's got some promise, but it's not a magic bullet. You need a good amount of it if you really want to get that. That's one of the reasons why we work with a concentrated extract that's a seven to one extraction. So you don't need as much. You can take you know, a teaspoon and get more than you would get in a normal tablespoon of other products. Okay. Here's connecting on the lion's mane farm. I got to connect with these guys who are some of the lion's mane growers and they're excited, kind of goofy, nerdy Chinese guys. <laughs> but um, I really enjoyed that myself. 
Uh, you can grow this mushroom at home. It's not hard, but it's very hard to grow it into fruiting varieties on a commercial level. We see people in the US growing it at a commercial level, but the problem is they're mostly using mycelium. And there are two different compounds in lion's mane, our haricinones and arinocines. They are only found in these fruiting bodies. Really, well actually arinocines are found in the mycelium a little bit, but the haricinones are only found there. And they're disaccharides. They're very functional and one of the most potent bits of chemistry that we find in uh, the lion's mane. And you really wanna work with good quality organic lion's mane and the fruiting body is the way to go. Okie dokie. Next we're gonna talk about cordyceps. Cordyceps is crazy. This one is interesting. Um, and I think it's one of the mushrooms for the times. In fact, when I was at the International Medicinal Mushroom Conference, there was so much more buzz about cordyceps than any other mushroom. Cause right now they're learning really cool things about this mushroom. So one of the things that's not in the slideshow that I thought was interesting that I'm gonna share with you right now is that cordyceps is not a single organism. They're, when they, when they hack it apart, they're finding like all these different types of genetic material in there. They're like, wait a minute, this isn't just like a fruiting body of an organism. They're seeing this wide variety. It's like a complex of multi-organisms. And so they're seeing that cordyceps can grow so much more adaptive and it's actually being now studied more heavily than reishi right now in Asia, particularly because they've already studied reishi like crazy, but really because they think it's the mushroom of the future. Uh, there's a belief that you can tease the genetics in cordyceps to grow out specific chemistry that might act for a specific um, issue. So we might see cordyceps in the future that has chemistry grown out to work with more adaptogenic function, chemistry grown out to work with more bronchial dilation factor, chemistry grown out to work with more immunomodulating factor, cancer treatment factor. So we're, we're starting to see that cordyceps produces really cool chemistry in small amounts right now, but they can tease the genetics. What I like about this is some of the things they found is they found the ganodermic acids that are in reishi in their terpene content. Cordyceps was able to grow this out. They found jacinicides from ginseng in cordyceps. They're seeing that there's like 70 different species of organisms of genetic material on the kind of biofilm layer around them. So we're just, we're just learning so much more of this mushroom. But it's been used for thousands of years. And really how it was originally discovered was yak herders up in the Himalayas found that these, these, the yaks were eating this little mushroom, this tiny little mushroom growing out of the ground. And then they were getting really promiscuous and they were having lots of sex. And they were like, whoa, these yaks are really like getting at it. They must be this thing they're eating. So we see that it's a bit of an aphrodisiac. And that's how we kind of first discovered it. Um, and these wild cordyceps are very expensive. We make one wild cordyceps tincture at Harmonic Arts. It's a South American and high Andes wild cordyceps. Um, and it's very potent, but it's also our most expensive tincture. This is very rare. You're not gonna find wild cordyceps anywhere on the planet. Almost every cordyceps you've ever taken in a capsule form is a vegetarian source. It's not grown on these insects like most of them are. But if you wanna have a bit of a interesting thing, Google, different types of like cordyceps on a tarantula, cordyceps on a beetle, cordyceps on an ant. This grows out of every insect. Most of it's grown on vegetarian sources now um, in uh, facilities, but it still has much of that chemistry. And what we see from Chinese medicine perspective is it's a supreme adrenal tonic. And this is where cordyceps has the big jam, is this working with the adrenals in fight or flight and stress. Um, it also opens the bronchioles, so it helps us oxygenate. So many athletes are using cordyceps. In fact, we've got a number of Calgary Stampeders who are using our cordyceps. We've got a number of, of heavy athletes. We've, we've talked to plenty of other practitioners who work with some of these athletes who are recommending cordyceps as one of their ways to give them an edge, to open the bronchioles and get better oxygenation. It works with altitude sickness. This is another reason why I think cordyceps might be a good one to work with right now with the bronchioles to open up and get better oxygenation for people who are concerned about viral flus. Better cellular oxygenation too. So when you're working out the lactic acid burn that you get in muscles, this helps diminish that. So you get more oxygenation to the cells at a higher rate. All right, so that's cordyceps. And I see some questions coming in, so I'm gonna just answer those in a bit. We are sitting at four minutes. We got, we got about 
10 minutes left in our webinar, so I'm gonna just quickly move through this and answer a few questions as we get through the top five mushrooms. All right, this is me visiting cordyceps facility. It's grown out with this um, cordyceps mycelium that I'm holding there. These are actually cordyceps in this picture that are grown on silkworms. Um, really cool. I've got a little bag of those right here. They gave me some from the lab. We went to the Hung Sao University and where they actually studied and grew out the top cordyceps militaris and found out how to grow that. These mushrooms that we work with are grown on a soybean and rice base to be able to get some more protein in them so you can get higher levels of cordycepine, which is the kind of main active compound in here. It's cordycepine. There are branched polysaccharides, but the cordycepine is the one that really shines. Um, we have higher levels of that. Andazine and cordycepine are both in this one, uh, and it's a potent, potent one. Anyway, that's that. Next mushroom. Oh yeah, this is considered the king. This big guy right here, chaga. Chaga is a potent antioxidant. It's got super oxide dismutase in it in huge levels. This is a free radical scavenger that helps pull out a lot of oxidative damage. So this is one of the top mushrooms on the planet. Something I would highly recommend you connect in with is chaga. Uh, this one makes a great tea. This is what I'm drinking right now. I also like making a chaga reishi tea, chaga reishi turkey tail tea. All of those are really good. It's very anti-inflammatory and has really good ability to work with cancer cells in the digestive tract in particular. Uh, there's plenty of medicines made out of this. There's one in Russia right now called B-Fungin that is a pharmaceutical that's made out of chaga that is used for tumor systems. Now, I'm not gonna prescribe it. I'm not allowed to do that, but I will say that if you Google it, you'll find a lot of information on that. It's easy to work with. It tastes super yummy. That's my, one of my favorite things about it is that it tastes really good. Another thing about it that's so amazing is that when you drink chaga tea, it stabilizes your blood sugar. It's really good for hypoglycemia. So I find if I'm doing intermittent fasting, or for example, I'm trying to eat in smaller windows in the day, I will drink chaga tea outside of that because I want to give my digestive system a rest. So this is one of those ones that really supports your resiliency and is great for the intermittent fasting, which by the way, is another great way to protect your immune system is to shorten your eating window and give your digestive system a rest every so often. So this is a very antiviral mushroom as well. That's all in the black layer on the outside of the chaga, which is the terpene content on the outside. The orange on the inside is much more of those polysaccharides and there's kind of vanillic acid. It tastes really good. It's much more tonic and more adaptogenic, whereas the external part has much more of that high potency concentrated betulinic acid from the birch tree. It grows on that and it helps stabilize cholesterol. So that's all I'm gonna talk about with chaga. I've done a number of videos on this. There's a full 20 minute download on YouTube. If you check out Herbal Jedi and Chaga, you'll find it. Um, as well as there's a download on Lion's Mane, as well as there's a download on a few of those. So I can give you more information through the YouTube channel. But really, that's the time we got to talk about this one. Just know that it tastes really yummy and it's a great base for making wild mushroom teas or syrups using chaga as a base. Okay, next one is turkey tail. This guy, hiker's mushroom. I love this mushroom. I talked about it a bit already in the sense of this is one of the ones that's been used for chemotherapy and is used for radiation therapy and has just been prescribed by the government as a, or at least the PSK, uh, one of the polysaccharide crestines that's in it, but also polysaccharide peptine is another one that's in this one that is very, very anti-tumor. Um, growth and is great as an immunomodulator. The other piece of this, it's got some polyphenols in it and it's got a little bit of terpene content in the turkey tail and it's shown to be very good for viruses. So um, that's another one to work with viruses on is turkey tail. Most particularly it's been used for HIV and hepatitis C, but there's definitely some evidence showing that it's good for other kinds of flu viruses in these types of things. So Anyway, turkey tail is one to look into. I like that it's antioxidant. I like that you can find it everywhere on the planet. I like that it protects our liver, which is our hardest working organ in the body. It's very, very potent, and it's super easy to extract and find and make medicine with. So it's one of my favorite mushrooms because I see it all over the place when I get out into the wood wide web to connect with mushrooms. So that's one thing that I like. Turkey tail is an amazing one, but realistically, my recommendation is that you, you work with a five mushroom blend. 
You actually work with all five of these together. We do a five mushroom blended harmonic arts, and I'm just gonna take the last couple of minutes to talk about that. Here's a slide about harmonic arts. We are a um, <clears throat> dispensary that's here on Vancouver Island that's really creating uh, some of the best herbs, superfoods, mushrooms, elixirs, and teas. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Harmonic Arts and I'm sitting here in the building right now as we talk. And I just, I wanna say that we prefer these fruiting bodies because they have more of these active compounds and they have more of this traditional use. And that's what we work with in all of our products and all of our elixirs and all of our mushroom extracts. We prefer to use the top mushrooms uh, that have been scientifically validated and used through traditional history. We make them more concentrated. So we have our five mushroom blend. This is probably my favorite blend. And what I would really like recommend seven out of 10 people, I recommend using all five of them because there's so many benefits to each one. And there's definitely been a lot of studies showing that people using a multi mushroom have better effects on immunomodulating and on protecting their immune system than just single mushrooms on their own. Even though Reishi has like 400 uh, polysaccharides and uh, Chaga has like 120 of them. And like, there's, there's a lot of these different polysaccharides in some of these by getting a wider spectrum from the full landscape of some of these top mushrooms, you're getting more potency. I do recommend a five mushroom over a 14 mushroom because you get five of the most top concentrated mushrooms. Although we do as well a 14 mushroom uh, tincture anyway, um, you can work with that as well. Okay, you can mix these into your coffee. You can put them into anything in your daily routine. They go great in smoothies. They're amazing in soups. They're just great in all those things. So I wanna say thanks for joining me. Um, you can find out all this stuff. I got a bit more to share. I'm gonna answer some questions. If you want to connect with um, what I do, um, I'm the Herbal Jedi. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on YouTube. Uh, we've got great products. Harmonic Arts has at on mushrooms, some of the top mushrooms in the world at harmonicarts.ca. And you can also learn more about this at wildrosecollege.com. Like I said, in October, I offer a mushroom course on this and we're always dabbling in this. We've got a wild rose village there where you can kind of get into the herbal community. And same with Harmonic Arts though, we've got a great Harmonic Arts kind of community growing around our business. And you can find our product in many of the different health food stores. So um, yeah. That's it for me for the base of the webinar. So thank you for joining me. I'm just gonna jump in here and answer a few questions and take the last five minutes. So if you got a few questions, add them away. You can also watch this in the replay. And if you have more you wanna share on this, check out the Facebook feed because unfortunately only a hundred of us were able to jump on this live. Um, so yeah, all right. So I'm gonna just answer a few questions. Can I consume them every day, says Andrea. Yes, you can. That's one of the beauties of them. Although I will say from my own personal experience, and I want to talk about dosage for a moment. Um, my own personal experience is I get bored of taking any one thing for a long time. So I'll do kind of intermittent mushroom protocol. So I'll take, I'll buy a jar like this. Um, and this will last me two months, maybe a month and a half if I'm taking a bigger dosage. And maybe a month, if I, this is 100 grams um, and I'm only needing a basically a half a gram per dose that makes it 200 doses but realistically i tend to take a gram to a gram and a half i find that to be better i like taking a bigger amount um, that's totally safe you can consume them every day my father's been taking reishi for 30 years straight uh, no problems there like i said they're very safe for also elderly and most children so one of the best mushroom one of the best things we can work with they also don't complicate a lot of pharmaceuticals, whereas many herbs have challenges with some of the pharmaceuticals. So they're quite safe to take comparatively to um, other things. My recommendation though is to take a break. I believe in the wax on, wax off. So take a little break every so often. I don't usually take medicinal mushrooms in the summer, but I start back up in the fall. I take a little break maybe from, I go from like September till October, at the end of October, maybe November, I take a break. And then as Christmas season comes up and everyone's getting sick again and I'm going to all these family things and all these Christmas parties, my immune system is more um, accessible by pathogens, we'll say, from all the social interacting. I'll start taking mushrooms throughout that time to just increase and support my immune system. And then I might teeter off in January, February, but right around now, before allergies kick in, um, before when we get other kind of seasonal colds that come in right around now, 
I would start taking mushrooms again in March. So I might do three runs of mushrooms through the winter and then I'll phase off come April, May, probably May I'd phase off and I won't take mushrooms from May, June, July, August, start back up in September again. That's how I like to work with them. So hopefully that answers your questions, but there's no problem taking them every day. If you want to work with a specific mushroom, like say lion's mane for cognitive function, I would take it every day for a while. So you want to work with reishi for grounding you down, or you've got an ADD kid, or you've got insomnia. I would take it for a good amount of time before taking a break. Okay, Lou is asking about chaga long-term. Is there any dangers? Not that I've seen, although I'll say this um, outer part, traditionally, they would take off the outer part and make it into a, a tincture or a concentrated extract of some form and drink just the inner orange bit for daily tonic use. The outer bit has the betulinic acid in it. And when you buy chaga, you're going to get the whole thing. But most likely, there's, a, there's like 90% inner part to about 10% outer part. You should be fine long term. Um, that's one of my recommendations, though, is if you really want to take it long term, I, I've been drinking chaga tea, I don't know, for the last 10 years. I drink it consistently. I drink it almost every day. Here at Harmonic Arts, we have this available on tap. Literally, we have a tea urn in the staff area for everyone to just drink tea. Um, and we drink it all the time. It's a great one to increase our immune system. It's also a good one to use as a base for making elixirs. I didn't talk about those. Those are going to come up in a future webinar with us. I'm just talking about elixirs and restoratives and making tonic drinks. It's one of my favorite things to do, but I'll use chaga as a base. Um, and I drink it pretty regularly. Okay. Um, let's see. I answered that live. Uh, let's see. Okay. Kayla's asking, um, do I make my own dual extract tincture? Or I, I do make my own dual extract tincture, but I'm never sure on the ratios I should use. Okay. So that's a good question. Um, and should, do I need to refrigerate it? Shelf? There's a bunch of different things, um, Kayla. And I'll, I'll just kind of jump into this really quickly. We don't have time to totally go into full depth. There's two kind of methods. There's one, you make your decoction first and you freeze it. And then you make your alcohol extraction and you put the two together. Well, the other one is you make your alcohol extraction and then you press off that, save that, and then you make your decoction with the alcohol extracted mushrooms um, that's already been pre-extracted in alcohol and you make that and then put the two together. Um, I prefer the second method because then you don't have to freeze it, although the freezing does help open up and make it more bioavailable. It's just a pain in the butt. How we do it here at Harmonic Arts is often we make an alcohol extraction and then we make a decoction every time we need, and then we put the alcohol into the decoction when it's cooled down. Um, my ratios, like <clears throat> for the late herbalist, I would say just pack the jar as full as you possibly can. Um, and for the kind of, if you want to make something that's got a specific ratio, um, so you have consistency, it's called a, we do a one to five. So one gram of mushroom to five milliliters of alcohol. And I'd use a 75% alcohol for my alcohol extraction. For my decoction, I might make a one to 20 to begin with and simmer it down to a one to eight, one to seven. So I've got one gram of mushroom to five to seven to eight um, milliliters of the water. Kind of concentrate those down. If you can get it down to a one to five, amazing for your water. Sometimes it's almost barely anything left in it there. And then I put the two together, making a one to five. That's our kind of extraction method. That's how I would do it. Um, also, I will say it's just too long of a question for me to go too far into there. Um, but that's where I'm going to start with that. Okay, is there a chart somewhere where alcohol percentages for tinctures? Yes. Um, one of my favorite ones, this is from Fraser, is asking this question, is on Matthew, or not Matthew, but sorry, um, Michael Moore, not the filmmaker, the herbalist, has a, has a website. He's passed away now, but it's called Southwestern School of Botanical Medicine. And They've got some great tincture logs on there. They don't have all the Nouveau ones, um, but they've got all ones with all the um, Latin names on that website. But also it's intuitive. If you go to um, some of the like Herbal Medicine Makers Handbook is a great book you can get on ma medicine crafting. Um, I'm, a, I'm trying to work on a course right now on medicine crafting for Wild Rose College and we'll have a lot of that in there and tincture percentages for alcohol. But I'll say for most leafy herbs, 40% alcohol. For most resinous herbs uh, that have like sap and oil and resin to them, you want 80 to 75% alcohol. If you're using a fresh herb, you want a higher alcohol, a dried herb, again, 40% alcohol. Most roots, 
40% alcohol. If there's terpenes in it, you need a higher content. If there's polyphenols in it, uh, you might want a little higher alcohol content. So like echinacea needs like 70%, golden seal 75%. Uh, so they're kind of like that. There's a bit of ratio difference. When in doubt, 40% will work with most herbs. Uh, that's my answer for that. Okay. Um, with mushrooms, I start with 75% alcohol for the alcohol extraction and then add the water. Putting the two together brings it to like 30% alcohol at the end. That's kind of a good ratio. Polysaccharides don't like high alcohol. So you want to bring the ratio of alcohol down. They'll burn off and they won't extract in the high alcohol. Okay, done. Um, can we please, okay, so Dipti is asking, can you please give recipes for the decoction syrup? Yeah, I can. Um, I know we do them in our wild rose group. We have a decoction syrup recipe. I'll give you a quick, quick recipe. I'll just verbally say it here um, for this. And if you're still live with us on Facebook, I'm gonna come back just so you know um, for the Facebook folks and answer a few questions afterwards and I'll come and do that in the next 24 hours. But for Dipti's question around, can you give a, lie, a, a recipe for the decoction syrup? I will say, I make a strong decoction, as strong as you possibly can with the mushrooms, decoct it down, and I use two parts of the decoction, of the tea that I've made afterwards, to one part of honey, to one part of 40% alcohol, right? So a bottle of vodka, one part vodka, one part honey, two parts tea. That's my decoction. So half of it's mushroom, half of it's preservative, honey and, and alcohol. If you want to make something that's just with honey and has no alcohol to preserve it, and you're going to stick it in the fridge because it will go bad, just so you know, it will go bad. Um, if you don't have the alcohol in it, you want to do one part honey and one part tea, right? So you just do one and one, but um, you can half the honey, which makes it less sweet, which is more ideal. I prefer it that way. Add a little bit of alcohol in it. It's like, it brings it to like a 12% alcohol or something like that. It's no big deal. Uh, when you actually put that in a soda stream or something, it's down to nothing. Add a little bit of water. It's down to very little alcohol. It's really just there to preserve it. Okay. And I got another question from you, Dipti. You got all the questions. Um, also, what's the traditional ratio for reishi uh, mushroom to water to make a strong decoction? Right. That's a great question. Decoctions, I would say making a one to 10, one part of, of mushroom in grams to 10 milliliters of water is a good strong decoction. Typically a tea bag when you put it into water is a, about a one to 200, right? Sometimes down to a one to 100, depending on how much water you use. One gram is using for 250 milliliters of tea. We see it even, even more sometimes. So get it down to a one to 10 if you can, a really strong decoction, but you're okay if you make one of the one to 100, you're still gonna get a good strong brew out of it. I would rebrew it though multiple times. That's one of the things I would say. Okay, so Lou is wondering, aren't you worried about heavy metals and mushrooms coming from China? Of course I am. This is definitely a big thing on the, the roster. And I, I wanna, I'll just address this really quickly because yeah, there are plenty of things with heavy metals coming out of China. We've all, I will also say though that Mushrooms have been the, like the main mushroom medicines have been in China for thousands of years. It's only in the last like 30 years that people have started to use them in, in North America. So the Chinese have been doing this for a long time. If you go to China, you'll see that, that well, actually first off with reishi mushroom in particular, did you know that 90% of the world's reishi is consumed in Asia? 90% of it. There's so many people in North America using this, so many people in Europe, that's only 10% of the world market of reishi. So there's a huge variety of spectrum. There's cheap, lower grade, middle grade, high grade, good quality. There's different ways of growing it. And then there's also the testing. So the mushrooms that we work out from, that do come from China are very well tested for heavy metals. We get heavy metal tests on every single batch. We also go in and do third party audits with our, um, our lab here in, on Vancouver Island, that we send the tests away to continually for our mushroom extracts to make sure that they come back clean. And we feel really good about the ones we're working with because of that. Part of the reason I went to China last year was for this exact question. Aren't you worried about mushrooms coming out of China? And what I found is, yeah, I got to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, we got to see some really bad quality mushroom farms just to get a handle and an understanding of like what 
what kind of toxic materials, how much plastic is going into the environment, how much, um, like what is the substrates that they're using? And we got to see this and see it tested. And so we've been able to find the best mushroom producers on the planet to really go through and look at this and look at some of the heavy metals and look at all of this kind of stuff. And we know that we feel without a shadow of a doubt, we're getting the best quality mushrooms coming out of there when they're coming out of there. Our chaga comes from, some of it comes from Siberian uh, birch trees and some of it comes from our, our west or east coast Canada birch trees. Those aren't Chinese, but we still test them for that. What's interesting is that uh, we do see that heavy metals come in mostly from these facilities that are in the lower altitude and growing close to the big cities and it's out of the water source that they've got. So yeah, any good mushroom supplier knows this though and they're really strict around um, testing their water and filtering all their water and they know that they're gonna get foul flack from the community. Anyway, I won't say more about it than that. Just know that there's very high quality and there's low quality. And so it's up to you to trust the companies that you're working with, if they're working with mushrooms from China, that they're getting the best quality. And, I, and it's been a huge anxiety piece for me and a big hang up. So we've gone through and done all the protocol we can to make sure we're getting the best quality mushrooms. Okay, oh, um, let's see. What's the best mushroom for fibromyalgia? Nikki's asking, and lupus. Well, many of these are autoimmune supportive. I would say reishi, and I would say uh, working with lion's mane and turkey tail. I would probably just go with a five mushroom blend, but reishi would be my favorite for fibromyalgia, and lion's mane would be my next favorite to work with that, Nikki. Um, and for lupus, I would say reishi and chaga and turkey tail are the most immunomodulating ones. Okay. Um, Kayla's got another question around, can I speak to counter and contraindications? Yep. I will say that's one of the bigger, like there aren't that many, which is brilliant with the mushrooms. There are a few, but most of them are really safe. The contraindications come in taking huge doses. I'd say cordyceps is the one that's most at risk here because of its way in which it enhances the adrenals and supports like works that way. It stimulates the body a little bit. That'd be the one I'd be more concerned about. But even people taking high dose cordyceps have not seen a lot of issues around that. So we're not seeing that as a big issue. Oh my God, I got so many questions here still, guys. I love you all, but I'm realizing I'm running into later time. I'm going to have to answer some of these um, in the post chat. All right, um, let's just see. So, Kayla, I'm not answering that entirely. Just know that they're quite safe. There's very few counterindications around these, especially with medicines. They're not like with blood thinners. You might see people who are like on heart palpitation medicines. And if you're doing something that's going to be working with your blood pressure, I just highly recommend you're checking with your doctor and modifying it as you add something like this in, because it might reduce your blood pressure naturally. And you want to just make sure your blood pressure medications, if you're on something like that, are, are going to be lowered in their dose as you naturally reduce this. Okay, um, so yeah, Rue is asking about mushrooms from China again. And yeah, there are definitely, like I said, I saw, I went to like the mushroom markets and I, and I saw the guys like smoking in the markets. Uh, I saw some of the growing facilities that were not that clean. I did see that and that is there and it's, it's definitely a problem. But, it, but I think that people give China a really bad rap. This is their best medicine. And many of the top growers in China and the top producers are really producing the best quality. The problem actually comes not so much in the organic source. For start off, all of our mushrooms are organic. We get from there. It's only, um, and it's a European organic certification, not a Chinese organic certification, because we need to have that higher level. And they work with our eco cert here in Canada. But I will say the bigger problem that you're going to see with mushroom extracts out of China is actually fake mushrooms and adding in maltodextrin and adding in all kinds of other things into their mushroom compounds where you see, yeah, there's a little bit of mushroom in there, but it's 70% not mushroom. That's the real problem. It's actually adulteration more than quality. People don't realize that, but that's especially when you're buying encapsulated products, 
there's often um, adulteration issues happening. So that's what I would be more concerned about. That's why we work with these powders and we work with the mushrooms we work with. Okay. <clears throat> um, oh, and I, an anonymous attendee said, you said turkey tail is prescribed by the government and PSK. Um, essentially, it's the, 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 um, the Japanese and even in China, the government covers this as part of their health protocol, as part of their health program. They cover this. This is a big piece of how they work. Um, and, and they've been doing that since the 80s. This has been um, basically a big part of going through chemotherapy and radiation therapy protocol is taking tur turkey tail because up to 400% better recovery rate. They've found that. In Canada, they don't at all. In North America, not at all. In fact, many medical doctors will tell you not to take anything when you're going through any of this. Um, and most of them don't know about mushrooms. There are definitely some that are turning their minds though and seeing that, wow, these mushrooms are really supportive and other cultures are using them that way. So it is growing. All right. Okay, so it looks like I still have 30 open questions. Um, Ganoderma aragonensis versus Ganoderma lucidium. Kimchi, I love your name, kimchi. Kimchi, by the way, is one of the best medicines for right now, spicing, warming up, fermenting, getting those lungs protected. Um, but uh, Ganoderma organensis is our West Coast reishi. Um, that is amazing. I think lucidium is a little more potent. That is your Asian reishi. It's been heavily studied. I prefer the organensis because it's got more of our wild fifth element from this part of the world. So I go out and harvest that myself. If I had a choice, I'd go organensis all the way. But I'll say that lucidium has more active chemistry in it and is a little more the one that's been heavily studied. So there's much more proofing behind it. There's a lot of other ratios though out there that I think are really beneficial. They just haven't been given enough time, like this Ganoderma sinensis that's behind me here, or the Ganoderma suja, or the Ganoderma aplanatum. Um, those are all amazing mushrooms that could be used that way. Okay, so um, can mushrooms be harvested any time or is it better at certain times? Basically the fruiting body, this is from Dolores, the fruiting bodies can be harvested anytime um, when they're in full fruit. That's what I would recommend, harvest them in full fruit. Um, okay, um, can you use them to make kombucha? I know one friend of mine who's taken a kombucha culture and he's been teasing reishi into his tea regularly. He's continually done this and he's grown his kombucha out to now live on reishi tea. So yeah, they can, but really most kombuchas need that caffeine. They need those elements in the black tea, but you can tease it in there and start to grow out your own culture. My friend totally did this. Uh, and I think it's, um, it's a good one. A quick little thing on kombucha for those of you who are still listening. Thank you for staying with me all this time. I appreciate it. Um, and those of you who are dropping off, hey man, we're way past our hour and 15 that we said we were, we're now at an hour and 30. Um, but kombucha originally comes from kombu, the seaweed, which is called sugar kelp, and cha, tea. So it's actually seaweed sugar kelp rack made kombucha. Um, all right. And um, yeah, looks like Kayla uses that method. All right. So can all wood mushrooms be used or are some poisonous? This is from Dolores. And yeah, I will say, um, Dolores, all ones that are wood-like, that have multiple pores, all these thousands of little pores, and grow on the trees, can be used. If they grow in the ground, don't trust them. They have to be growing on the trees and have multiple pores. Some of the wood-like mushrooms that don't have pores, they're spiky and maybe rubbery, don't trust them. Polypores, they've got multi-pores, grow in the trees and they're wood-like. Those are all your medicinal mushrooms and all of those can be used. But there's ones like Dyer's polypore that grows out of the base. That's not a medicinal mushroom. It's not really growing on the tree. It's growing at the base of the tree. So um, use the ones that are growing in on the trees, polypores, and there's lots of them. You don't necessarily need to know the name, but in your environment, there may be like seven or eight really common ones. And so it's not hard to start identifying those. Is it harmful to take too much every day? Like anything, you can. You can die from taking too much water every day. Um, but, but mushrooms are pretty darn safe. So this is another question. Um, and yeah, it's easy to be really hard to overdo it. Like I said, I ate a whole jar of lion's mane with a friend. Um, we were fine, loved it. But I think there's a threshold where it's not really more beneficial. 
right? To take reishi by a tablespoon, that's like the max. I'd probably start with a teaspoon max of our reishi concentrated extract. That's all I would go with. Um, any more than that, maybe a tablespoon, you get a little more benefit, but not more bang for your buck. I'd rather see people take more consistently small doses. Okay, that'd be my answer to that. When making mushroom essences, would you recommend adding a few drops of alcohol to preserve it? Yes, Anjali. Um, if you look at Robert Rogers' book, um, Mushroom Essences, I think he talks about this, but what you wanna do is you're gonna do it in water, right? Or some people do it in oil, and you're gonna add those drops in later. Yeah, you totally wanna add those in. Um, I would highly recommend um, adding in alcohol to lock it in, but you do that at the end, right? You don't wanna make an essence with the alcohol in it, you use it to lock it in. All right. Um, are all five mushrooms mentioned tonight available to find in the rainforest up by Tofino? <laughs> um, I will say not chaga. Turkey tail is. Um, there's a bear's tooth mushroom like uh, lion's mane. You're going to find that up in the forests. You're going to find, um, yeah, basically turkey tail is the only one you're really going to find that's the exact same species. But you will find reishi, the Ganoderma aplanatum, and the Ganoderma um, organensis. And you will find a bear's tooth that's similar to that, um, but you're not going to find chaga and you're not going to find cordyceps. And Josh is asking if we sell our products in San Francisco Bay. No, but you should check out harmonicarts.ca. That is our website. We totally ship to the States or harmonicarts.com for you Americans. Um, and there's, there's been a couple of people in the San Francisco Bay area that have been asking. We are going to try and help support some more American folks because they really want to work with our mushrooms too. Um, that's about all I can do. All right, I'm going to have to pause it on the questions, guys. Um, we're already at our time. So I just want to say thanks for joining me. If you have further questions, you can ask them, and I will try to get to them in the replay. Uh, just may the forest be with you. Thanks for joining me on this live webinar tonight. I just appreciate you all, and we will talk to you again soon. Bye.